So it was the first time I'd ever been on television every week so they can kind of get used to you. I did quite a lot of uh, risque things. I don't have no memory of them particularly. Um, oh yes, am I allowed to say cunnilingus? <laughs> <laughs> Hey, I'm Bill Nye, and this is the timeline of my career. To tell you the truth, I fancy a drink. Do you have time? Well, I'm working on my thesis, but, um... Well, we could talk about it over a drink, if you think it would help. I first became interested in acting at my secondary school, where we had a drama priest who was keen on uh, putting on plays, and I was tall which was uh, a result because it meant I didn't have to play girls. I ended up going to a drama school. It was the Guildford School of Dance and Drama. I think I learnt not to have my tongue hanging out of my mouth. I remember I did one play and a friend of mine said, that was interesting, that thing with your tongue. I said, I said what thing with my tongue? She said, you had your tongue out a lot of the time, but I had no idea that I had my tongue out a lot of the time. So I learned to keep my tongue in my mouth. I don't think I've ever met anyone like you. No, well, you wouldn't, would you? Why? There isn't anyone quite like me. The Men's Room was a TV series, and it was the first time I'd ever played a lead in a TV series. There was a lot of sex in it. I had to have, I had seven, six sex scenes, seven sex scenes, say that quickly, with four different women. And I remember I was in a hotel lobby and a guy handed me a paper and I hadn't watched the thing and I don't, and I was in such a state of self-consciousness that I didn't have any clear memory of it. And he handed me the newspaper with the, with the medical page. And on the medical page, it said, if you have a, a pacemaker or any kind of heart issue, do not attempt the things that Mr. Nye does on BBC Two. And I was thinking, what? did I do on BBC Two? And then later I did see in another newspaper in the listings for the TV, it said Cunnilingus on BBC Two, wow. So, you know, and I have no memory of that either. All I remember is trying to obscure various parts of different women's bodies, which was my gig, which was your responsibility as the man, because there were so many parts of women that weren't allowed to be on television. And then you'd if I end up in ridiculous positions and then somebody would say action. And you felt like saying, really? Hi, kids. Here's an important message from your Uncle Bill. Don't buy drugs. Become a pop star and they give you them for free. The casting of Love Actually was involved a read-through, or I think what they call in America a table read. And there was a tradition in those days that casting people would ask a favor of actors and they would ask you to do a table read with no possibility of you getting the job and it was just a courtesy to, uh, to the casting person. And that was the situation with Love Actually. I read the part of uh, uh, Billy Mack, and then subsequently, much completely to my surprise, I got the gig. It changed everything because it was a big hit, and it was a big hit in America, and it changed the way that I went to work. And it meant that one of the greatest things that ever happened to me in Ask Any Actor, it meant that I didn't have to audition ever again for the rest of my life. So that's like one of the biggest things that could happen to an actor. You don't have to sit in any of those outer offices, sweating, worrying, short of breath, going in, making a fool of yourself and going home and, you know, weeping. Hi, Billy. Hello. We're live across the nation and you're number one. <laughs> How will you be celebrating? I don't know. Uh, either I could behave like a real rock and roll loser and get drunk with my fat manager, <laughs> or, when I hang up, I'll be flooded by invitations to a large number of glamorous parties. Rock and roll veterans were a new genre. You know, there was, you know, they were only just becoming. So, uh, and they were sort of, in, somehow, they were just funny. They may have been other things, they may be heroic or romantic, but they were also funny. And you only have to mention certain names and people will smile. It's partly because they came out of our youth and they're still there and that, it's cheerful. It's partly because it can get slightly preposterous in terms of style and delivery. It's an amalgam of things you've observed or listened to over the years, but there was no member of the Rolling Stones that I was channeling or any other uh, real life rock uh, character. Um, it was just me kind of, you know, uh, imagining what I might be like if I were, you know, in that situation. Elton, of, of course. 
Of, of course. Send an embarrassingly big car and I'll be there. <laughs> when did I realize that love actually would have an impact on my career? I can't really remember. It might have been when bus drivers started honking or cab drivers would wave or people in shops would say, hey, Bill, and you'd go, excuse me? I'd had a very, you know, familiar English career and I was happy. There was no, you know, I wasn't in any trouble. But this just took it up to a, another level. I just wanted you to be strong and, and not give up because you lost your dad. Philip, you don't have to explain. Huh? I wanted to be a part of Shaun of the Dead because the script was one of the best scripts I'd ever read in my life and it made me laugh uh, in a whole new way because the jokes were very original and very dry and very droll and very different. And then I met Simon Pegg and Nick Frost and they were great, you know, and they were charming. And they made me laugh. A lot of my experience on Shaun of the Dead was bleeding to death in the back of a Jaguar, or actually it was a Daimler. And I had a like a blood tube up my trouser leg and a blood sack, and it was a very hot summer. So I sat in a congealing pool of fake blood on a leather seat for hours and hours and hours. And they would pop in every now and again to make me laugh. And it was very kind. They would do their Al they both did knockout Al Pacino impersonations. So they would come in and give me a bit of Al, and then they'd go away, and I'd feel a little better about that. I did like that moment in the movie where, where his stepdad come, becomes tender towards him. And, and for a long time, young men, they're all between 17 and 39, come up to me and they would say, you've got red on you. Or they'd say, I'm, I'm not your dad. Well, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow then. You've got red on you. What kept me coming back to the Shaun of the Dead, Hot Fuzz, At World's End, uh, Axis of Evil, it was just very good fun, you know, and the scripts were always great. And I am proud because they called those three movies, they are officially called the Cornetto Trilogy. And that's because there is an ice cream in England called a Cornetto and that there is a Cornetto featured in each of those movies. It's so stupid, it doesn't bear thinking about. And in fact, in one of the movies, they had a shot simply of a Cornetto wrapper floating, being blown in the wind across the street in order to be able to call it the Cornetto trilogy. That's how serious they are. Do you feel death? Do you feel like the dark abyss? All your deeds laid bare. I can't remember the reason for my reluctance around playing an octopus man in Pirates of the Caribbean. I remember sitting in the back of a car and the estimable, marvelous Gore Verbinski rang me. He was on a mobile phone who I'd never spoken to before in my life. He said, come on, how many times do you get to be in a pirate movie? I said, well, what does he sound like? And he said, wet. I said, well, yeah, okay, that didn't really help. So I said, yeah, but like, where, where, where from? And he said, well, he said, the ship is called the Flying Dutchman. So maybe he's Dutch. Nobody can do Dutch, except Dutch people. So I said, well, how about Scots? He said, yeah, great, how does that sound? So I end up doing this Scottish accent in the back of a car on a mobile phone with the driver looking in the rear view mirror going, what? And it was all a bit, you know, awkward. And then by the end of the phone call, I think I'd agreed to be in the movie. And then when I got there, I didn't realize that I wouldn't have a costume like everybody else. So I actually phoned the costume department and said, is my costume coming anytime soon? And they said, has nobody told you? I said, tell me what? Then it turned out I had to wear computer pajamas with white bubbles all over them and a skull cap with a bubble on the top and 250 dots uh, painted out on my face and sneakers. I mean, trainers, which is a stretch for me anyway, but trainers with a bobble on top. And then, I, then they introduce you to Johnny Depp and Orlando Bloom. If you ever felt lonely before, now it's for real. And I used to wander about the set just saying the money over and over in my mind, because they gave me quite a lot of money. That's why I went. I went for the money. And people wouldn't have lunch with me. It was too sad. Members of the crew would go, hey, hey, you know, hi, hi, you know, and they'd just walk away because it was just too sad to see this man in late middle age dressed as somebody who didn't get into Devo or something. It's one of the things I'm most proud of that I didn't go to the airport, you know, I didn't go, do you know what? I thought I could do, this. please, can I go home now? I didn't do that. And I think it was right up until the, the, the uh, Gore said action for the first time. I really didn't have much of an idea. And then I just went, and it's amazing what happens when you're very, very scared. 
I keep the boy 99 souls. But I wonder, Sparrow, can you live with this? And I went into a sort of violent Scottish accent, which I'd never done before. It just sort of came out and I just kept going. And then at the end he said, well, that's great. And I was like, maybe, maybe there's a God, maybe. What do I know? And I didn't really have a clear idea, neither did they, of what the creature was actually going to look like, except that they knew he'd have tentacles. So every now and again, if I came too close to anybody, they'd say, no, you can't do that. I'd say, why not? They'd say, because your tentacles will get in the way when we paint, when we, you know, put them in. And when I first saw the creature, I was blown away. And it was so incredible. In fact, Gore, the first thing he said to the, pe the, the, the people who made it was get your ex acceptance speech ready. That was his remark. And indeed, they won an Oscar. And I said to him, when I next saw him, I said, you know, it's as you said, you know, every expression, you know, all my gestures, all the physical stuff, it made it on the screen. He said, yeah, but I was lying. I had no idea if it was going to make it on the screen. I just said that to cheer you up, which was, you know, cute. Glad to be of help. You were nice about my tie. Yes. And today is another cracker, if I may say so. But The moment in the episode of Doctor Who that Richard Curtis wrote, which was how I became involved, where I play the art gallery curator, he gets to do what anyone who's aware of Vincent van Gogh has always wanted to do, which is to drag him from the past and say, look, they're worth 20 million bucks now. You can buy dinner, you know, which was every, is everybody's art fantasy. I had conversations with Richard about uh, Vincent van Gogh and about his suffering, about his mental torture. And that informed that moment because I tried to remember that and had it been possible to bring, drag Vincent van Gogh into the, into the future, it might have to some degree eased his mind, but I doubt that, but you never know, even momentarily. I have tears of joy. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. You're, you're welcome. You're welcome. Sorry about the beard. It said in the script, a bow tie. And I and the costume person rang me and said, what kind of a bow tie would you like? And I said, well, I, I don't know. I have a, how about a navy polka dot? He said, fine. And he came back and he said, I can't find a navy polka dot tie. I said, well, don't worry about it. It's, it can be a green polka, it could be anything. It was only a thought. He said, no, 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 it's okay because the, uh, the women in the wardrobe, they're sewing the dots on one by one. I said, please, have they started that? Because please tell them to stop because there's no, it's not required. He said, no, no, they're happy to do it. I get down there at three o'clock in the morning and the guy who gets me out of the car is taking me to my trailer and he says, you know the, the ladies in the, in the water, you know they're sewing? I said, yeah, I, I heard about that. And then I go into makeup and the makeup girl goes, you know that bow tie? I said, yeah. I did hear, they're sewing them on one by one. And then I go on the set and Matt Smith comes up and he says, the bow tie? And I said, yeah. I know about the bow tie. He said, well, it's only right, he said. I'd, I'd sew shit on your tie. And I said, can I quote you on that? And he said, yeah. I said, so now I am. Thank you, Matt. We, ever your servants, will continue to defend your liberty and repel the forces that seek to take it from you. I think the idea of my character in Harry Potter having made the transition from soldier to politician was something that I did discuss with David Yates the director who I'd um, worked with three times before. And therefore we had a pretty good, you know, thing going. And I admire him tremendously. We've done some great stuff together. Is that it then? Not quite. Dumbledore left you a second bequest. The sword of Godric Gryffindor. I did wonder that I was the only English actor of a certain age that wasn't in Harry Potter. And I was trying to come to some accommodation about that. You know, all of my friends were in Harry Potter, you know, and I'm, a, I'm not hard to find, do you know what I mean? I was quite pleased. And my grandchildren, you know, they're gonna be thrilled. I mean, they're only, they're not, I don't think they've seen anything I've done. They're completely unaware of my career. Can you believe that? They have no idea who I am. I assume you're some sort of secret service. Well, the other night I was pissed off because you wouldn't tell me. What makes you think I'm in the security services? Because most people can tell you why they visit the Middle East. Well, I've worked with David Hare all my life, more or less. He's the great professional relationship I have. I've been very, very fortunate to work with great people more than once. And he, I've worked with more than anyone else. We've actually done, he counted recently, 10 things together. The Warwicka Trilogy 
was um, was you know a perfect situation for me because not only was it David's writing which I love and I love speaking his dialogue because he writes like nobody else and he writes great jokes great world class jokes but also because he was directing it he sort of he hadn't directed anything for many years and I've always wanted to play a spy and he has the same kind of enthusiasm about spies as I do in other words a romantic idea so I got to smoke in the rain in a pretty good coat and a suit pretty good suit you know you'd be walking over Battersea Bridge in London in the rain in the at three o'clock in the morning smoking a herbal obviously cigarette and uh, trying to look cool so it was everything I like really very formal well um, yeah this is an odd moment for me because I had the same moment with my father when I just turned 21 and after it, my life was never the same. So I approach it pretty um, nervously. About Time is probably the film that most people talk to me about now. I don't own a car, so I walk everywhere. So I meet a lot of people and the one they mostly talk to me about now, and a lot of young people talk to me about now is About Time. When I got the part in About Time, I was very, very moved to be offered it because I knew it was very personal to Richard Curtis, who is the other great professional relationship I've had. You know, it transformed my life, my relationship with Richard. And about time, I think, you know, he really, he said it was gonna be the last film he ever directed, which is bad news for me, but, but I get it, you know, I understand. And he said that if I were to follow the suggestions made or the suggestion made in about time, why would I direct films? Because they drive you crazy. So I get it. I thought I had to be like sort of everybody's dad, sort of a version of dad. And the first thing that came to mind was Jason Robards in a film called Julia with Vanessa Redgrave and Jane Fonda, where he plays Dashiell Hammett. And he's not a big part, but he, he made a great impression on me because he was just kind of there. He was around and they would go off and do brave and heroic things all over the world during the Second World War. And they'd come back, he'd be making a fire on the beach and he was just there. And he did it with such restraint, with any absence of any careerism or selfish concern. And I wanted to be like that. I wanted to do it really plain with what I, how I described it to Richard was no acting, which is what everybody says when they don't know what else to say. But I meant it, you know. So I tried to do it as plainly and as simply as possible. I think I just thought with the time thing. No, I never said we could fix things. I specifically never said that. There aren't many people who can get through that scene. You know, I, reading it the first time, you know, it moved me tremendously and it always moves me when even when, and people in the street try and tell me about it and get moved while they're trying to tell me about it. I think he really, really hit the spot on that one. But without it, these villages are nothing have finished. That's what I'd say. The film Pride, the story, nobody knew the story, except Stephen Beresford, it seemed, who wrote it and the people who lived it. It's the most extraordinary story, but it wasn't one that anybody wanted to tell, uh, certainly not in the, the press of, the, of that time. I was passionate to be in it because it was about two things very close to my heart. One was the total uh, misrepresentation of the miners' strike in 1986 in, in England, where decent men and women were characterized as enemies of the state by the then government. Whole communities were decimated and they still haven't recovered. And also the emancipation of gay men and women in my lifetime, which if I were to be asked by my grandchildren which developments in my lifetime I was sort of obscurely proud not to have impeded in any way, it would be perhaps the civil rights movement in America and the emancipation of gay men and women in my lifetime. It's a magnificent story. And also there's a bit where the unions turn up at the end in buses and coaches to join the gay pride event, which always makes me cry because those people have come from not wanting to be around anyone gay to being to want to hold a banner and march down the street with them. This is a big deal. Papa. Mr. Weston is such a good humored, pleasant, excellent man. He thoroughly deserves a good wife. And you would not have had Miss Taylor live with us forever when she might have had a house of her own. A house of her own. Where is the advantage of a house of her own? This is three times as long. I did have a reluctance to be in adaptations of Jane Austen, Charlotte Bronte, those kind of things, because I couldn't trust myself not to be drawn into 
conventions which I always am uneasy with when I observe other people doing it. In other words, speaking funny. Standing very straight, like everybody stood up in the 18th century, I don't think so. And speaking in a way that, you know, it's like Shakespeare. I don't do Shakespeare. I mean, I know he's the greatest poet that ever walked the earth, but the performing of it, I'll leave to other people because I can't, I have no real enthusiasm for the challenges of the iambic pentameter. I'd rather, I, I'm more interested in contemporary idioms and how to make it sound like it just occurred to you. That's the gig, it's not rocket science, but it's not nothing either. But then I met Autumn de Wilde and it was a whole other thing. And she was completely, you know, she was very, very impressive and she's a brilliant person. And she made it very clear that it wasn't gonna be like that. And she was approaching it from a whole other uh, angle. And she came from California and she's a self-described punk and uh, I thought the combination might work. And eventually I just thought, yeah, we'll do that. From a visual point of view, she's absolutely meticulous and inspired because she's a photographer. She's worked with bands. She's done a lot of videos. She's had to do a lot of that stuff on her own without a designer, without anybody, you know, a one woman band kind of thing. So now she's hands on. So she's checked if the wallpaper clashes with the coat you're wearing, forget about it. She's that meticulous. And it's very, uh, it's very impressive. And I, and, and I was, not mistaken, it was a great experience working with her and I hope to work with her again. I didn't quite know how I would speak again until they rolled on the first day, until somebody said action. I think I had a line that was something like, it was a bureaucratic line, like referring to a, a, a folder. Uh, uh, and I think I had to say something like, is the D19 in situ or something like that. I'd spoken the script uh, in my flat over and 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 over again so that I could give the appearance of never having said it before, which is the gig, you know, it's just that's what the job is. You don't have to have lived something to act it. That's sort of the point of acting. You don't have to be the thing in order to act it. That would only, that would, if that was, a remark that somebody made, that would be the remark of someone who didn't know what they were talking about. And there are a lot of people who remark in that way. The only thing you can really act is stuff you've, you've observed in other people. That's what you act. So for instance, if you're asked to act somebody who's intoxicated, say, you don't act you being intoxicated because you can't report back reliably from a state of intoxication. You, you act based on observations of other people. Uh, who are intoxicated. Similarly, with anything else that may not have, you know, that, 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 that might have happened to you or might not have happened to you. Personal experience in terms of acting is um, seriously overrated. I think the biggest lesson I've learned, 97% of any of the negative thought that happens in my mind is a lie, a cruel, lousy lie. Second thing is, you can go to work while it's lying to you as long as you have a plan, as long as you're organized. It can go on. It's like being tuned to a radio station that has nothing but bad news about yourself. But you can operate whilst it's nattering. And the third part of that is, other people don't know what's going on in your mind. Hallelujah. Thank you very much. <laughs>